Hello and welcome to Twist List, today we are looking at, 10 fascinating stories behind historical open letters. The reputation of the open letter has taken a bit of a battering in recent years. Pop singers use them to lecture other pop singers on their state of dress, and celebrity chefs to appeal to their mother-in-law. Yet there was a time that an open letter could be a catalyst for social change. People wrote letters that landed them in prison, or worse. Here are some open letters from history whose stories put today's offerings to considerable shame. The fifth spot on the list is occupied by, Richard Oestler. George Washington Williams was an impressive individual. He was just 14 when he enrolled with the Union Army and fought in the Civil War. He then fought in two more wars, until injury forced him to retire. He became a pastor, a lawyer, a publisher, and the first African-American elected to the Ohio State Legislature. He wrote two groundbreaking books on black history, then decided to travel the world. He was still in his thirties. In 1889, Williams was in Belgium and given the chance to interview King Leopold. The pride of Leopold's empire was the Congo Free State, a veritable paradise for Europeans and natives alike. Leopold boasted all about it, so Williams said he would like to see it for himself. The king had clearly not expected this of his American visitor, as he discouraged it immediately. Williams was having none of that and went anyway. In 1890, he wrote an account of his visit in an open letter to Leopold. It was scathing, almost sarcastic. I was anxious to see to what extent the natives had adopted the fostering care of your majesty's benevolent enterprise, he wrote, and I was doomed to bitter disappointment. Instead of the natives of the Congo adopting the fostering care of your majesty's government, they everywhere complain that their land has been taken from them by force, that the government is cruel and arbitrary, and declare that they neither love nor respect the government and its flag. Your Majesty's government has sequestered their Number land, four on burned the list their towns, open stolen letter their to the property, United enslaved their women and children, was not and the only committed other crimes the first too numerous letter to, to mention in the detail. Bloodshed of the, first the full World letter is War. long, but in 1914, in it, it was a British suffrage of crimes Hopouts, against humanity, who sought a which wasn't to bring the fighting to an end. end. Her trials. intended audience Sadly, wasn't in Britain, Williams died though she targeted women on his way home from Africa at the age of 41. Her letter was published in Leopold December 1914 with a character assassination in the, the New York Times, periodical of the which is still available on their website. Alliance. The Do open letter cemented Williams' reputation in human rights history, history, but that Do is as about as happy an ending as you can find. Prompt us to Leopold's join hands fall with the from women race only came countries, later, and urge our rulers to stay further bloodshed. The letter was signed by at least 100 women. A response, signed by 155 German and Austrian women, came in return, but the biggest impact was across the Atlantic. In January 1915, 3,000 women attended a conference in Washington and formed the Women's Peace Party. In Europe, a conference in The Hague was planned for the 28th of April. The British suffragists made plans to turn out in force. The British government had other ideas. At the third For place the days we the have women would have been traveling, all the most shipping was stopped. letters are often Only those three that carry the greatest among the 1,000 to the 100 in attendance. There are few risks greater German than women had also been the military dictatorship and which you made it through. And arguably Despite few more noble efforts, causes, the United Women were able to accomplish an end to the bloodshed. published an open letter on March 24, 1977, critical of the military junta that had ruled Argentina for the previous year. He was shot dead the following day. Walsh was the figurehead of underground journalism in Argentina at the time. His daughter, also part of the resistance, had shot herself six months earlier, after being trapped by the military. Walsh began his letter with a list of his reasons for writing. The gagging of the press, the persecution of intellectuals, the raising of my home in Tigre, the murder of dear friends and the loss of a daughter fighting you are some of the facts that have forced me into this kind of clandestine expression, after having spoken freely as a writer and journalist for almost 30 years. The open letter has been described as his last will and testimony, and also as a suicide note, he knew he was a marked man. By the time Walsh wrote his letter, 15,000 Argentine citizens had already disappeared under the dictatorship. The letter told the junta, you have arrived at a form of absolute, metaphysical torture that is unbounded by time. 
Walsh held little hope that his letter would be able to make an impact, but he wrote it to be faithful to the commitment I made a long time ago to bear witness during difficult time. His commitment was unquestionable. At the second spot is, George Washington Williams. Martin Luther King Jr. wrote one of history's most famous open letters, his letter from a Birmingham jail. It's a powerful piece that we've brought up before, but you might not realize that it was prompted by an open letter from opponents of the civil rights movement. The first letter lacks the power of kings, he was, after all, one of the 20th century's most renowned and quoted speakers. The authors of the initial letter were eight clergymen nobody has heard of, and their letter would be of no consequence if King had not responded, since it has found its place in history, it is interesting to examine. If it had been published online today, it would likely be seen as tone trolling that is, insincerely criticizing a person's methods under the guise of being helpful. It followed local marches led by King, who had been jailed as a result. They wrote we are now confronted by a series of demonstrations by some of our Negro citizens, directed and led in part by outsiders. We recognize the natural impatience of people who feel that their hopes are slow in being realized. But we are convinced that these demonstrations are unwise and untimely, the writers claim to oppose segregation, and their concerns may have been genuine. They wanted patience and caution, and opposed confrontation. The best response is the one given by King himself, why direct action? Why sit-ins, marches and so forth? Isn't negotiation a better path? You are quite right in calling for negotiation. Indeed, this is the very purpose of direct action. Nonviolent direct action seeks to create such a crisis and foster such a tension that a community which has constantly refused to negotiate is forced to confront the issue. It seeks so to dramatize the issue that it can no and longer finally, be ignored. At number one, my citing Open the creation of tension as part the of the work Matthews, of the non one of the most famous sound world. rather shocking. In Sicily, but I must their confess homeland, that I am a large afraid portion of the, of the Matthews income is from I have earnestly opposed violence tension, so. but there is a type of are forced to pay a certain amount of the mob tension fear that was necessary for growth. They are threatened with everything from arson and it was necessary to create a tension in the mind so that individuals in the Sicilian town of Bologna a half -truths One to man the that didn't realm like of Grassi, but and he went further. Grassi so was the owner of the successful non-violent business, flies employing one kind of attention in society Not that only will help he men rise pay, from the dark depths of prejudice and raise his paper to the majestic heights of understanding to publicly announce his stand. It was a bold move, and dangerous. As a result of the letter, Grassi was shot three times in broad daylight on the 29th of August the same year. His letter began Dear Extortionist, and suggested his harassers should save themselves the bother of buying weapons, as he was never going to pay them. Local businesses were too scared to offer their support, but the letter received national attention, and Grassi appeared on television. His display of defiance in front of millions of people wasn't something the Mafia could afford, Grassi's public execution was an the example to everyone else. Is Today, the a large number of, of businesses are the standing up to the, the criminals. The victims a campaign is the group, dominant image Adia we Pizzo, get from painters and counts 450 people among its membership. Today, businesses display that signs that announce their resistance to, to the criminals, the and, and locals are encouraged to vote with their Therefore, wallets. It is it's not that perfect, the limbs of the one restaurant requires an armed police guard, but it's progress. There is, however, a simpler solution. The nails could be inserted between the ulna and the radius rather than the palms. The bones and tendons of the wrist are strong enough to hold the weight of the body. The only problem with piercing the wrists is that it contradicts the description of Jesus' injuries in the Gospels. For example, in John 24:39, it is stated that Jesus had his hands pierced. Many scholars have tried to explain this contradiction with boring and predictable claims about errors in translation. The reality is that none of the authors of the Gospels had been direct witnesses of the events. 
The earliest of the Gospels, the Gospel of Mark, dates to circa AD 60 to 70, about a generation after Jesus' crucifixion, so it is not reasonable to expect a high degree of accuracy in such details. Number 4 on the list is, Roman method, there was not a standard way of conducting a crucifixion. The general practice in the Roman world involved a first stage where the condemned was flagellated. Literary sources suggest that the condemned did not carry the whole cross. He only had to carry the cross beam to the place of crucifixion, where a stake fixed to the ground was used for multiple executions, this was both practical and cost-effective. According to the ancient Jewish historian Josephus, wood was a scarce commodity in Jerusalem and its vicinity during the 1st century AD, the condemned was then stripped and attached to the crossbeam with nails and cords. The beam was drawn by ropes until the feet were off the ground. Sometimes, the feet were also tied or nailed. If the condemned was able to endure the torture for too long, the executioners could break his legs to accelerate death. The Gospel of John, 19.33-34, mentions that a Roman soldier pierced the side of Jesus while he was on the cross, a practice to ensure that the condemned was dead. At the third place we have, causes of death, in some cases, the condemned could die during the flagellation stage, especially when bone parts or lead were added to the whips. If the crucifixion occurred on a hot day, the loss of fluid from sweating coupled with the loss of blood from the flagellation and injuries could lead to death from hypovolemic shock. If the execution occurred on a cold day, the condemned could die from hypothermia, neither the traumas caused by the nail injuries nor the bleeding were the prime causes of death. The position of the body during the crucifixion produced a gradual and painful process of asphyxiation. The diaphragm and intercostal muscles involved in the breathing process would become weak and exhausted. Given enough time, the victim was simply unable to breathe. Breaking the legs was a way to accelerate this process. At the second spot is, Forensic Evidence, Analysis of the Bones of a Crucifixion Victim published in the Israel Exploration Journal has revealed a form of crucifixion that is rarely displayed on paintings or mentioned in literary sources. 
In this case, the bone injuries showed that the nails penetrated the side of the heel bone, rather than the traditional position of the legs that we see in many depictions of crucifixion victims. The study suggests that the victim's legs straddled the vertical shaft of the cross, one leg on either side, with the nails penetrating the heel bones. This study also explains why the remains of crucifixion victims are sometimes found with the nails. Apparently, the condemned man's family found it impossible to remove the nails, which were normally bent due to the hammering, without destroying the heel bone. This reluctance to inflict further damage to the heel led, to his burial with the nail still in his bone, and this, in turn, led, to the eventual discovery of the crucifixion. And finally, at number 1, abolition by Emperor Constantine. Under the Romans, Christianity underwent a surprising transformation. It started as an offshoot of the Jewish religion, turned into an outlaw cult, became a tolerated religious expression, developed into a state-sponsored faith, and finally became the hegemonic religion of the late Roman Empire. The Roman Emperor Constantine the Great, AD 272-337, proclaimed the Edict of Milan in AD 313, decreeing the tolerance of the Christian faith and granting Christians full legal rights. This crucial step helped Christianity become the official Roman state religion. After centuries of practicing crucifixion as a torture and execution method, Emperor Constantine abolished it in AD 337, motivated by his veneration for Jesus Christ. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video and would like to see more then please hit the subscribe button.